I was just telling Melissa, I have so many spelling errors in my notes. I, instead of whorehouse, I put whore, whorehorse. <laughs> <laughs> I like a whorehorse better. <laughs> Such a slutty horse. <laughs> Whoring around yeah, here. Detective horse is also a whore. <laughs> Never got a whole another horse. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 4, Episode 13, titled Vote of Confidence. It originally premiered on February 12, 1988. It is written by John Shulian. That name should sound familiar because he also wrote Down For The Count Part 1 and 2 and Amen Send Money. Also teleplay writer for a bunch of other episodes. He's got some good episodes under his belt. Yeah. Yeah. Willing to take a little yeah. chance, too. He killed Zito. <laughs> I'll never forgive him. <laughs> that bastard. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Till he did it on purpose. Yeah, he killed him on purpose. <laughs> the director is Randy Roberts, and it's the only episode he ever directed. And it just seems like such a fake name. I was like, I'm what? Randy sorry, Roberts. Sorry, Randy, but I'm sure you're a nice guy. But Too- Got a fake name. <laughs> Two first names. <laughs> Before we get started, we can check in see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, you know, we've been paying attention to what people in the 80s have been up to and checking in occasionally. And Melissa made an observation today on what's happening with people from the 80s. <laughs> I was saying, you know, that you feel old when all the actors that you used to watch in your favorite shows in, in the 80s and 90s are now on the Hallmark Channel <laughs> making movies and shows. Uh-huh. So, for example, uh, the girl who played DJ on Full House, she has a murder mystery show mm. on the Hallmark Channel. Also... She's trying to figure out who killed that other... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also, the girl that played Jesse's wife, I can't remember her name on there, she's on the Hallmark Channel. Mm. Winnie, the Wonder Years, mm. she's on Christmas movies. Dean Cain, Superman, he's on Christmas movies on the <laughs> on the Hallmark Channel. I mean, ever since we watched The Plane versus Volcano. Oh, yeah, I know. He can't but... get any other work, but <laughs> the list goes on and on. Even so... John Larroquette. <laughs> really? <laughs> I saw that. I live by both of our uh, mine and Dominic's parents, and so I see a lot of the uh, Property Brothers. I did a little research one day, and apparently the Property Brothers have also starred in several movies on, on like the Hallmark Channel and ABC <laughs> Family. Because people love They're legitimate those- <laughs> actors. Yeah, people love them. People in the a generation so, ahead of us also, love them. <laughs> also, one of them is really a magician. He's an actual magician in real life. Yes. They have another brother, and he's a DJ. I just pictured it in my head, and based on their looks, because they look a lot like Will Arnett, I imagine Joe. Oh, they're Canadian. Magic. <laughs> they are Canadian, super Canadian. No. Yeah, I mean, it's Canadian magic, whatever that is. <laughs> he's got a dead dub in his freezer. <laughs> he's dead. I didn't know what to do with him. <laughs> Well, believe it or not, pals, we had three weeks in a row where we had a so and bad episodes <laughs> of Miami Vice. On a scale of one to ten, we're floating between a three and a four for the last three weeks. This week, we got a solid seven. We got yeah. a good episode. Yeah, this is a good episode. Very politically driven episode, too. So forgive us ahead of time as we work in politics jokes into the podcast. <laughs> We're not picking sides. We're not choosing winners. We're not We're weaving politics permanently into this show. Not but in the show. No. We, we do pick sides at home. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about this week's episode. So when we open up the duo or watching a political it's not a debate it's like a commercial or something right yeah it's like a campaign like commercial. A speech yeah someone running for governor congressman from the state of florida running for a governor they're working late at night Tubbs is watching as she's trying to keep up what's what's happening in politics keep a pulse on what's happening and sunny is like this is why i don't get into politics this guy's a greaseball well i mean he's not far off but <laughs> i believe he says snake oil salesman yeah it's about right yep. it's all right He's he's selling plenty of snakes in this episode. (laughs) I just love how he's listing all the different types of immigrants and minorities that will like him. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Tubbs teases Crockett about liking the other guy, who's a fascist, by the way. That's what Tubbs says. And Sonny just kind of rolls his eyes, which is the way he has to do this whole episode, but also doesn't let up on the investigation. So I don't know where Sonny stands here. I think he doesn't like politics. That's what that's about. But don't I worry. I think Tubbs may lean a little bit to the left and Crockett may lean a little bit to the right, but they're still partners. 
kind of see through their differences and they agree on seeking out punishment against criminals. Why can't we all just be like that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jump to the train robbery in progress. <laughs> <laughs> they can't hang out for too long because they got a whore train. <laughs> to, to stop. It's inventive, though. <laughs> I've never heard of a whore train, a whore boat. Seen it. It was, <laughs> it was just house. so randomly how they jumped there. Also, what was with Zwitek's gun? How many whores was he going to shoot? <laughs> when so let me back up. Sunny says <laughs> if we got to go on this panty raid <laughs> on this train, right? Yeah. And then. Well, we jump to the next scene, and, and Swiatek's so there with that AR-15 on his shoulder. Yes. And Sonny even says, like, aren't you a little overarmed for, yeah. for a, a hooker raid? I'm like, it's a literal fucking train. <laughs> <laughs> You're still on it. It's, yes. it's a panty train. It, I don't think they brought enough flares. Did you see all the flares <laughs> that they had laid out? What were those even for? Can a train stop that fast? I don't know. That's what I was saying. Like, do they have the power to stop the train just by putting flares out? The train's not like, well, there's some flares along the road. <laughs> Why did the guy with the bull ho horn identify himself as the Memphis police? Maybe it was T Tubbs was the one on the bull horn. Yeah. And I think he just says, like, this is the police, which might sound like, <laughs> me like with Tubbs speak, okay. Memphis police. <laughs> I, I was like, when did they get to Memphis? I'm so confused. <laughs> No, I think he says this is the Metro Dade Police. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's the, the, okay. That's the county they're in. He's like, this is the Metro Dade. <laughs> so, how did they get to Memphis? <laughs> also, why is Sonny looking right into the bullhorn? He's going to complain about it being too loud. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> oh, my ears, man. The train stops. The ladies were on board. They were working undercover. Sonny even said, mentioned something to Trudy about the caboose. Make he also mentioned something to Gina when she's arresting somebody he knows. And he's like, and he, she's like, I'm not that kind of girl. I'm a nice girl. And then Crockett's like, yeah, she is a nice girl. <laughs> like, creep. Get out of here. You're married. You can't get to mention me about me in the bed anymore. <laughs> His wife's in L.A. She doesn't know. She doesn't know he's on a whore train. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing she's gone. She would never understand the whore train. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think many wives would understand a whore train. <laughs> so they start busting people including cha-cha don't forget about cha-cha they and, got him and her caboose mm -hmm. trudy's caboose yes <laughs> and the last people off the train are a woman as we'll find out later is annie and the governor candidate that they were just watching on tv mm -hmm. mr senator Pierce. gary hart i mean i mean governor <laughs> um <laughs> pierce pierce thank you governor pierce not senator gary hart hookers are very creative this was such a fantastic idea for the hookers like whoever put this whore train together <laughs> this is the, this, this is such an amazing idea that they did this like you get a good trip all around <laughs> great you know views, uh, relaxing I, I had heard amtrak was trying to you know reinvent themselves trying to get more people to ride i think um, this might be the way we gotta send them this idea we gotta let them in on this one i'm telling you <laughs> a commuter horse train <laughs> get ready for work <laughs> Got a long commute. We've got the right lady for you. My favorite part about this is that Crockett laughs when he sees that when he sees who it is, and Tubbs is shocked. And the laugh is not just that the this governor candidate was on the train, but he's also laughing at Tubbs. He's like, like Haha, this, this is your person yeah. that you like, and look, he's sleeping with whores. Yeah, and Tubbs looks really hurt uh -huh. about it. He's like, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. Now, before we get started, this is our moment to check in with the guest stars in this week's episode. And John already hinted at one that it's actually a guest star. <laughs> but in spirit, he is in this episode. This episode is a rip from the headlines episode that in 1988, there just happened to be the senator, Senator Gary Hart, who was basically out front as the presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. He would actually drop out of the race after photos and stories began to appear of him having an extramarital affair with one Donna Rice. Donna Rice, in her own, very successful lady and has a little bit of a vice tie-in. So, uh, but before she got involved with that, she was actually a model and actress. And back in time, she actually met... Gary Hart at a New Year's Eve party of her then boyfriend Don Henley. 
whoa, this is getting real mixed up in Vice. <laughs> Miami reporters would catch on. They would get pictures of Hart and Rice together, including one where Rice is sitting on Hart's lap and he's wearing a T-shirt set that says Monkey Business, which was also the name of the yacht they were on. <laughs> um, yes. Sorry, but yes. if it, you're going to get caught cheating, get caught cheating with a Monkey Business shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, they never actually proved that he was cheating. And Donna Rice and Gary Hart, they never faltered. They always said it was they were just remained friends and that it was never sexual. But Donna Rice was actually in an episode of Vice. She was actually a guest star in Forgive Us Our Debts. Which is crazy that we missed her in that she must have had a very big part. Episode. Yeah. 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 She must have been a co star. Must have just kind of, you know, breezed past her or something. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, whoever does she, the guest the- stars. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm yes. joking. <laughs> so, since 1994, she's been president and CEO of Enough is Enough, which is an internet safety for children advocacy group. She's an author, speaker. So, but I, I like, through advocacy group like disney called on her to help fight disney porn because apparently disney porn's a thing mm, you know it's also a thing is like along that vein is like disney weirdo youtube video so they have like elsa and goofy murder each other on them and stuff and they sneak through and they end up mm-hmm. on the kids app. that would be horrifying yeah. for your child <laughs> yeah so her group enough is enough they actively fight those types of things Other than Vice, she also did an episode of a soap opera called One Life to Live. Here we have this episode that's based on an actual event that's going on at the time. And with this actress who not only was on the show, but was also on the soap opera of actually three of our guest stars. Mm. Larry Pine, who plays Tom Pierce. Shelly Birch, who plays Angelica Payson. And Lucinda Jenny, who plays Annie Pierce. All were regulars from 88 to 92 on the soap opera One Life to Live. Can't be a coincidence. Like, that was on purpose. They has to, like, pull all this together for that for this one episode. Yeah, they must have. Pretty much outside of that connection, all of the guest stars are pretty much, they've been in, you know, one episode of this show, one episode of that show. Nothing too major. So, like, the only connection and tie-in w- was this soap opera, aside from some of them being stage actors. The only other guest star I actually felt worthy of mentioning was Moultrie Patton, who plays Grover Watkins. He was best known for his role of Walter on the TV show Northern Exposure from 93 to 95. But I wanted to mention him. He is a bona fide hero. He was awarded the Silver Star for Heroism in the Battle of Monte Cassino in World War II. Mm, Wow. Wow. That's it's amazing all the people who served in World War II when they came home, like what they went on to do. It's not you don't hear about like, oh, the soldiers, they just kind of turn into construction workers and factory workers and stuff like that. It's a huge gamut. Like they they pop up all over the place. Mm-hmm. So when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct, and Gina's telling a story about a man on the train wearing a diaper with a pacifier in a crib. Interesting. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> they must have been filming real sex on this train. Yeah, I know. We've seen that. We've seen that one. <laughs> diaper bib in a crib. A lady calling him. Well, he calls mom. We saw that episode. It was weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is weird. That one of the people pretend like they're horses. Uh, the horse one oh. is strange. <laughs> <laughs> they did an episode of Bones about that once. <laughs> <laughs> Two suits walk in and they want to talk to Crockett and quote Stubbs. <laughs> that was my favorite part. <laughs> I want to talk to Crockett and, the, and Detective Stubbs. <laughs> Tubbs is already mad right away. I just, from now on, Stubbs is for when Tubbs is like six inches shorter. Stubbs. <laughs> His alter ego, Stubbs. <laughs> that's, just so, that's his whore train alter ego, Stubbs. <laughs> yes, exactly. One of the suits works for Pierce. The person who was caught on the whore train, he's his campaign manager. The other is Deputy Commissioner Hazlitt. Now, in the first half of this episode, 
Crockett is very intrigued why Hazlitt will help out the campaign manager, and then that just kind of disappears. So in my notes, I have yeah. Hazlitt as a very important person, and then he just kind of goes away. Yeah, he's gone. He just disappears. <laughs> well, you know, Crockett tells him to hit the bricks, and so he does. Plus, I mean, I'm pretty sure Dad wanted to fight him. Did you see Castillo? <laughs> How dare you come into the OTC yeah, and bring- without my permission? <laughs> you can't keep bringing all these people here. This is undercover. And, and that's what Crockett says. He yeah. says, get lost. I'm not going to talk to you. I have no reason to talk to you guys anyway. And I don't know why the deputy commissioner thinks that this is a good idea. I wish I would have finished that out and find out why. They said like the mayor told him to come down there or whatever. Hmm. Or the commissioner. He said the commissioner told me to come here. Yeah, that's what's so like why ever the commissioner I think what they were were trying to say is it's the same thing with the prosecutor where she was like, I'm not going to prosecute it. It's because they're all they're all want him to win, so they're not going to go against it. This last governor was kind of a d bag. Yeah, we really need a new guy in there. <laughs> and then Castillo comes out overhearing the conversation and says, "You need to talk to me first, asswipe." He's mad. Let's go in my office and deal with. And then never you never hear anything out of that. <laughs> no. <laughs> what no, are you doing that? Because no one wants to fight, Dad. No, that's uh-huh. a ninja. He showed him a speedo in there. He was like, "Look, don't make me take my pants off and spite you." <laughs> Look at my range wearing this. <laughs> Watch me stretch. At Pierce's campaign headquarters, he's talking to his team. He's like, we got to buckle down. and I got to stop and... going to horse. <laughs> no, that never comes up. <laughs> that never comes up. No, no that's like, never oh. the problem. <laughs> Sleeping with the hooker is never the problem. It was that he got caught. You got to go to better hookers. Ones that don't drive their train right through town. <laughs> For everyone to see you on there. I told them to turn left. <laughs> go around. Don't these tracks go around town like every other train track? <laughs> I think the only thing that's really important about this scene is that we find out that his wife, Annie, is a trooper. Apparently. <laughs> she don't care. <laughs> He's like, oh, she knows about this stuff. She's not. She don't want to sleep with me. She, she's happy she's I'm on the horse fine. train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, the vice team are over talking to the prosecuting attorney, and she's saying, we don't have enough uh, for a case. You can't prove that he was actually sleeping with her and why he was there. You have no evidence to be able to prosecute on this. And so I'm not going to move forward. Go get me some actual evidence. And you can just see the disappointment and the frustration on the duo's face while they're there, too. See, he was there campaigning, you know, trying to get the whore vote. <laughs> Um, uh, passing out buttons. It's all explainable. He got confused, got on the wrong train. Yeah, exactly. You know, next train thing he knows, he's, he's sleeping with a hooker. <laughs> and trying to run out the back door. He was going to the bathroom. The train <laughs> jostled. It fell he on her. fell out of the bathroom. With his pants down. With his pants down, yep. Do a head back over to the precinct to go talk to Dad, and they want to continue their investigation. Sonny especially didn't like that Hazlitt was leaning on them to say, hey, you should just give this up. By the way, this is the last time we talk about Hazlitt. He's but boring. <laughs> Sonny thinks something's fishy because Hazlitt's involved. Castillo says it's a dead end. Clean up your own cases. Don't worry about this one anymore. <laughs> Do some actual real work. How about that? <laughs> and he's kind of right because they actually, by the end of the episode, they don't actually prosecute anybody. Well, it, well, they do end up arresting the the murderer, a murderer like the like one of the loan sharks that killed the reporter. So oh yeah, somebody. yeah, but th- not not <laughs> but Vice. Not them, Vice doesn't not them, no. arrest anybody. Nope. <laughs> Vice doesn't actually. Someone else arrested the guys who exactly. actually committed the murder. Now, Stan has done some real police work. He's got photos of someone who... <laughs> of hooks. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> He's got photos of someone who is known as someone who torpedoes other campaigns. He sneaks in. He undermines the entire campaign. He tries to give the pictures to Sonny, and Sonny goes, yeah, whatever. He just walks by, and Tubbs is like... It's okay, buddy. I'll take a look at him yeah, for he you. Got, he talks about him. He looks through him and he's like, this guy looks like one of those guys that would give out candy to little girls at the playground. That's yeah, a funny but, thing. Yeah, and I thought that was kind of kind of strange, you know. So, yeah, he's telling them they, this guy's the uh, campaign screwer-upper and apparently he has a driver's license. <laughs> so, it, Tubbs is like, uh, I mean, then Crockett's like, uh, yeah, he looks like someone that passes out candy to young children. And it's like, that's, that's, that's kind of creepy, Crockett. Yeah, what? Like, why do you gotta go there? <laughs> I was just really hurt for Stan because Stan did this work. He really wanted to show Sonny, and Sonny was like, "No, get out of here! I don't want to take a look at it." It was Tubbs like, "No, and we should Tubbs probably take a look like, at this." Hey, pal, I'll take a look at it for you. What do you got? <laughs> and he looks at it like, "Sonny, these are really good. You should come over here and look at these." And Sonny's like, "Ah, fine. Did, let me did, see." Did he, did, did he put them on the fridge for him? 
<laughs> framed. So now there's a meeting between Bloom and Angelica. Angelica, I said Annie in the beginning, but her name's actually Angelica. She's the person that Pierce was sleeping with. Now she's meeting with Bloom, the person who Switek had the pictures of. Yes. They're discussing what it sounds like that they're in cahoots to undermine the Pierce campaign. Mm hmm. For the person who's running against him, Cowan, yes. in the primaries. Yeah, and she's saying that she's friends with Cowan, and they go way back, and they're trying to pay her off for her involvement. And she's yes. like, I'm not going to take your money. I don't want your money. I'm like, we got, we have a history together. Me and him go way back. I don't need money from him. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. He only offers her $10,000, and she wants Stormy Daniels' money. <laughs> um <laughs> He's nowhere in the ballpark. She got 130 k okay? That <laughs> yeah, 10 grand's a long that. way off. <laughs> well, I mean, inflation, inflation, but I mean, she, she's still entitled to more than 10 k I mean, come on, piss off. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. But, you know, nowadays, apparently, when you do those things, it doesn't matter. So you don't even need to hide it. <laughs> by the way, by the way, can you spot the soap opera actors in, in this scene? <laughs> the one with the giant hair. <laughs> <laughs> so the duo go to meet with a man who's been investigating Pierce for a long time. His name's Fraser. He's a reporter. He's been working for a long time. He wrote a huge expose about Pierce and like where he came from and everything he's done. He asks the duo, have you read my reporting? He's like, now we'll get to it after a war and peace. Mm -hmm. Like, fine. Pierce was a fast riser in his law firm. He went into politics. He was immediately successful. He's like the white knight riding into Florida state politics. So everyone wants to ride on his coattails. He is going to be the definition of success in politics in the state of Florida. A little bar, but you know, yeah, but I mean, Florida, it, it, it I guess is it's pretty Florida. high. <laughs> right behind us, I, Arizona. <laughs> I, had trouble, I had a hard time following this scene because of the competing beards in it. <laughs> you could feel the tension between Tubbs and this reporter. He was unsure of, of his beardy, beardedness. <laughs> <laughs> Fraser also says that power causes people to become sexual deviants, essentially. That once they get into power, it's like an aphrodisiac, and then they can't stop themselves. They just like to go get on whore trains all over town <laughs> and just get, can't uh, stop get getting on done. the whore train. <laughs> so, so six months. He says six months into politics, and you're basically Warren Beatty. Politics turns you into Bullworth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's back two weeks in a row. Bullworth mentions. <laughs> yes, it's not going away, folks. <laughs> I'm going to find a way to get some of that music into my music, too. <laughs> the reporter says he's got to run, though, because there's a press conference from Pierce to acknowledge what he was arrested for. And the Fraser's like, this is going to be the implosion. You guys want to come along, come watch. And so they head over to the press conference and Pierce says, I'm not stepping down. It's ridiculous that reporters and police want to get into my personal life. And also it's fake news. Yeah, basically. It's <laughs> yeah, the media. Yeah. The media is All the, the hookers in the world couldn't stop me from running for governor. <laughs> so then at the cigar lounge, the duo go to talk to someone that Pierce had worked for for a long time. His name's Grover Watkins. And he's still following up on Pierce like the the the, the duo are there. Even though Dad said, like, don't put too much work into this. Like, you guys got other cases to work on. They're still following around, checking up on Pierce. Grover says that he's known Pierce for a long time. He was his rabbi. Then he asked him to come work for his campaign. And then one day, Pierce decided he was going to run for office and basically stole all of Grover's staff and forced Grover into retirement. And yeah. he says, quote, that booger Pearl harbored me. <laughs> <laughs> Such an old man thing to say, right? Now, now you know I, I, you he's know, a war hero. Maybe, maybe he put that line in himself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I feel like we learned a lot about the governor's character in this scene. We learned he's edgy. He has terrible balance. He <laughs> takes money from the devil, and he doesn't spend the time. Yes. <laughs> He did say that. Where does it all go? He doesn't spend it. <laughs> <laughs> and so he gives Crockett and Tubbs everything that they're looking for, like a reason to continue to investigate. And Crockett says with a wink, like, he gets you, you get him. And Grover says, you're a fast learner, Mr. Crockett. Not right. you, Tubbs. <laughs> Not you, Mr. Stubbs. <laughs> you're 
your soul. <laughs> Mr. Stubbs. We find out that this guy's got more fake money than the game of Monopoly. And at the precinct, Trudy's able to put together a list of all the dummy companies that the campaign filters money through. And even though it looks weird, there's nothing illegal about it. So they can't really do anything except for do some more, use it as a reason to continue to investigate. They show it to dad. Dad's like, okay, fine. One more day. Yeah. But keep doing the other work, too. <laughs> Over at the Pierce campaign headquarters, Mrs. Pierce is talking to Bloom, and she wants him to resign. She knows it's him, not necessarily him that's setting him up with hookers, but knows She drove like, him there. He drove him there, yeah, yeah. He drove Pierce to the train. He's the one leaking information. Like, he's the problem in the campaign. Bloom has got to go. And with her, you know, I, I actually got... I kind of get kind of a Bill and Hillary vibe. All she cares about is becoming a uh, first lady. You know, I'm starting to wonder if we've left Memphis and they're in Arkansas at this point. <laughs> so now Pierce has another TV interview or campaign speech that he's going to do. The duo are going to go over and try and see him before he goes to give his speech. They're following up on what Grover told him. And what they've been able to find out about these dummy companies. But before they can get there, Frazier goes in, the reporter, to go see Pierce. And he says he's able to get through the campaign manager because he says he's got information to help Pierce with the police. He lets him in, has a private conversation. We're not able to hear what their private conversation is. But he leaves right before the duo show up. Pierce says, can you guys give me like five minutes? I'm going to go do my speech on TV and then you can come interview me afterwards. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Now, whatever the reporter told him had to be important. He stops the guy who's put an eyeshadow on him and makes him leave. You know, you know how important your that eyeshadow <laughs> game is in politics. I mean, that's all people are talking about this week is eyeshadow. <laughs> Pierce goes on and gives this speech about it being a victimless crime and that the police and the press have nothing better to do with their time other than investigating into his bedroom. Or, you know, investigate him for breaking the law yeah. and sleeping with hookers on a hooker train. <laughs> Exactly. Everyone wants to know how you get on the whore train. <laughs> where, where is it? Where are the stops? <laughs> <laughs> he then says, I'm leaving. I'm not running for office anymore. Bye, bitches. Mic drop. <laughs> I Poof, quit this bitch. <laughs> Leaves out the back door. He says, good riddance that the police and the press won't have Tom Pierce to kick around anymore. Because <laughs> they were kicking him all over the place. <laughs> oh, yeah. He just disappears in a puff of smoke like magic. <laughs> <laughs> the duo and the campaign manager are shocked. The duo realize that Pierce might then be trying to give them the slip. They run to the back to where his green room was. He's gone. Nowhere to be found. Total magic. Now, this is where it gets really weird because now when we go back to the precinct, they're being the duo are being investigated by IAD. And it's not weird. It's like it was it was a turn I didn't expect. And then when they did it, I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like all of a sudden Tom Pierce has disappeared. The duo were investigating him, and he felt like he was being harassed, even though he's on the whore train. <laughs> but they are accusing, <laughs> IAD is accusing Crockett and Tubbs of, like, helping like, Tom Pierce disappear. Yeah. Or, like, causing. No, no they're, they're accusing them of causing it because they went too, basically, too hard, and they, they went up above the law. It sounds an awful like they're accusing them of working for the Cowan campaign. Yes, that is what that, they're doing. Yeah, th and that they're dirty. Mm -hmm. And that they purposefully undermined uh, Pierce. That this was a political hit job. Guys, on. guys, Russians were clearly behind the train bus. <laughs> <laughs> clearly. <laughs> I saw the conductor. He looked Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Cassio's waiting for him outside the room when Tubbs and Crockett finally have enough. They come walking out and talk to Dad. Tubbs is like, I don't know why IAD is always up our butts all the time. They have a poker with our names on it. <laughs> Which is totally true, right? Did yeah. You, mm -hmm. Dad says, you guys should go talk to Bloom. And so that's where the deal are off to. We have a quick scene where we see at the, like a Capitol building or something in Tallahassee, maybe. I don't think it's in Miami. It was, it's got to be so, so somewhere else where the reporter, Frazier, is talking to Cowan, the opponent to Pierce. And Cowan is paying Frazier for his role in ruining Pierce. So, like, getting him the information and, and getting him to drop out is basically. But Fraser says. And he's giving him conveniently $10,000. 
which I'm assuming is the same 10000 that they tried to pay the hooker. I mean, like, why deposit it and have to redraw ten grand? I mean. <laughs> Fraser then says, why don't you keep me on the payroll? Like, I'm good for something, right? Why don't you continue to pay me? And Callan's like, no way, man. That's blackmail. <laughs> um, what? <laughs> what are you doing right now? What are you doing to the other guy? The duo run over to Bloom's, and they try and call him out for working with Cowan too. And Bloom tries to lie, but isn't that good at it. But still doesn't admit to anything. He pretty no. He pretty much says that he drove him there. He won't say that he's actually on that. Cowan actually paid him to do it, and he won't for whatever reason. He takes this big stand, and he's like, "I won't rat anyone else out. I won't tell you any more names. I'm already going to be like a pariah. I'm not going to take anyone he, else down with me." Over at Angelica's, Fraser wants Angelica to reveal to him everyone who's in her quote unquote black book. He wants more dirt. If he gets more dirt, he can sell more stories. He can get more money. But Angelica's, I don't have to give anything to you. I don't keep any names. You can't blackmail me. It's like, I'll put you on the front page of every newspaper. Everyone will know that you're a whore, a high-priced whore that sleeps with all the politicians. She's like, I don't care. Yeah, she she's not scared of him. He even gets mm-hmm. really angry and breaks a glass and stuff. And she's like, this is the way you think you're going to get something done here? No. Like, <laughs> and just walks away. Once again, I, I'm really enjoying the the extra drama added by our soap opera guests. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the precinct, the duo and Castillo are watching TV, and Spears' campaign team is continuing to work. So it's like a news story that's saying that the Pierce campaign is still moving ahead, even though it feels like it's for nothing. Castillo turns off the, the TV. Vice murder Pierce next at 11. <laughs> Castillo says that IAD is still investigating whether or not Crockett and Tubbs are involved. But he wants them to go talk to Annie, Pierce's wife, because no one's apparently done that yet. Yeah, you think, why didn't they talk to her first? I don't know. Like, right when you went Just missing. A woman. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> At the Pierce headquarters, the duo show up to go talk to Annie, and she's like, saying, everything happened so fast. The pressure was really high. I could tell he was afraid. He didn't tell me, but I could tell that he was. But... And then he just disappeared. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't know where he went. Doesn't know what he did. Doesn't know what he's been involved with. She's just continuing to run the campaign as if that's not weird. Yeah. By the way, I make I, I make that joke about her, you know, oh, she's just a woman. Because they also didn't interview the prostitute that he was caught sleeping with. Yeah, that was ever, weird too, right? They never point. went to the prostitute as the cops never, did. Not Everyone once. else did. <laughs> yes, including the murderer. <laughs> <laughs> just thought it was funny. They're interviewing all the guys, but not interviewing any of the women involved in the case. Apparently, they're like going to continue to investigate this case, but not really. <laughs> Just half ass. <laughs> <laughs> Phone in it in. <laughs> At Angelica's, we see Bloom leaving. He's murdered Angelica. Or at least it looks like Bloom has. Yeah, I still don't know what the hell he was doing if he didn't murder her. What was he doing then? He just saw know. like he saw her dead and then washed his hands. <laughs> Maybe he walked in on uh, her and saw that she was dead and, and tried was like, to help didn't her, know what maybe. to do. So later, the police are there at Angelica's, and there's no sign of anything sexual. No one broke in. It's like someone just walked in, strangled her, and left. Trudy interviewed the Clearly neighbor. Clearly killed by KGB agents. <laughs> <laughs> Trudy interviewed the neighbor. She saw Bloom there. The Casio gets a call and says Bloom's been arrested. Very fast, because apparently the vice squad was not doing that police work, so they got everyone really fast. It's that Memphis PD. They're really good. <laughs> At Miami Day Jail, they do our questioning. Bloom, he stands by. Like, I'm not going to out anyone else. I'm not going to give you any more names. Yes, there was a camouflage network that helped undermine the Pierce campaign. But I'm not going to give you any more names other than there was this guy, Frazier, who kept feeding them dirt on Pierce. And Frazier seemed to know everything about everyone. Now, Bloom says he didn't kill her, but he did say something weird about Frazier. Yeah, but he doesn't actually deny that he killed her for like a long time. They're like, you know, you're going to be blamed for this. And he's like, oh, okay. what about this guy, (laughs) Frazier? Also, I I didn't kill her. (laughs) I want to point out, so this guy's campaign is full of moles, operatives, and opportunists. Does that sound like anyone else's campaign of recent memory? (laughs) Yeah, it rings a bell. I don't know. I can't hear you. It's out of my $40,000 soundproof room. (laughs) 
the duo head over to the newspaper to go talk to Fraser's boss. And I don't know what's up with this boss. He says that Fraser's known for having a gambling problem and he always gets payday advances, but also he's a really good reporter. Yeah, like he couldn't believe he was crooked, but he could believe he was a he was like a junkie and then he <laughs> yeah, it was a junkie gambler who's yeah. always behind on his bills. And, yeah, and owed and, money all over town, but wouldn't sell out like that. Yeah, but he was like basically like when he's in a when he's in a good spot, he's good. But when he goes off the rails with his with his gambling, it goes bad. But not bad enough mm. to take money though, like, like bribes, I guess. <laughs> well, well I the know. press are always known for their good morals. <laughs> so the duo leave from the newspaper office. They're driving. They're out of everything. They don't. They run driving every right lead. past the commercial bank. <laughs> they've run every lead they've done they put in way more work than they should have ever put into this case because so they've, they've had nothing to work on other than maybe some dirty finances maybe uh some whore trains that they need to figure well, how out how come they on. never talked to the prostitute though did all that that leg work they just didn't go that extra step <laughs> before she was murdered obviously and maybe if they weren't doing the investigation mm-hmm. Jelko would still be alive exactly mm-hmm. but now they do have a real case to solve who killed angelica but they're not going to go back and do any investigation into that. Not really, no. It's going to all just fall right in their laps. <laughs> yeah, because when they're driving, Stan calls. He passes through a call from Frazier. And Frazier's saying, okay, listen, I know you guys are on your way to me, but I have a complaint to make because some people are here right now to come kill me because I owe $75,000 to a bookie and the bookie's muscles here to come kill me. So I want to confess N- to not you. Not the bookie's muscles. They look awful KGB-ish to me. <laughs> <laughs> he confesses that he killed Angelica, that he needed more dirt on more people. That way he could sell more and he could get more money. And then he snapped and just killed her. So confesses that he was using it to not just blackmail Pierce, but the blackmail Cowan. Everyone across the board, he just wanted to get dirt on everybody so he could make more money. And then the muscle breaks in, Fraser hangs up the phone, and then by the time the duo show up there, he's dead. And so is the case. So we learned, we learned that Tubbs drives real, real slow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he didn't seem any... Ur- but Crockett didn't like act like it was urgent either. Like, maybe tell him to speed up a little bit. Like, <laughs> I know they're all calm. <laughs> Like he's dead. Well, I guess we don't have any hurry to get there. We can stop at Denny's and get some food before we go. <laughs> but they can investigate these murderous bookies now, right? I mean, it's gambling and they're killing people. They should go investigate what's happening here. Somebody will. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't actually fall under what Vice does. You know, gambling, <laughs> hookers, like that's out of their purview. Politicians, no, right in their real house. <laughs> also, crooked record labels in the state outside of theirs. Yep, exactly. Mm-hmm. At the precinct the next day, Stan comes in, shows Sonny the paper. The headline is that Pierce is getting back into the race now. They also have a match on who killed Fraser, so someone else did their job. It's cool. They figured out who killed, so they're going to go make an arrest. The vice team doesn't need to actually do anything. That Memphis PD is on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Castillo says that Pierce is willing to talk now, so the duo go leave to go see him one last time. They show up to the Pierce headquarters. It's a full house. Tub says it's a house of true believers, and in there is a prosecutor who wouldn't move forward with the case. She's a donor and a supporter of Pierce. She swings by just to tell them, this is the nature of the game, man. She's very smug about everything, and she's like, that's that kind of attitude that doesn't help us. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of attitude? You're supposed to be like... <laughs> She just wanted him to win, so yeah. she she blocked. She, she did what she was supposed to do for the campaign. She threw a block, downfield block. So I wanted to point out that Gary Hart, after the scandal, dropped out of the race. Uh, the guy who the episode's based on. He then came back as a nominee, but then eventually dropped out again. So I don't I don't have high hopes for Pierce lasting with his second time. Although I will say, <laughs> Pierce probably could have beat Michael Dukakis. <laughs> <laughs> Pierce comes out, handshaking, smiling. Mr. and Mrs. Pierce give a speech. He says he went into self-imposed solitude and says that the state needs the leadership now more than ever and more than he needs privacy. I'm going to keep being in hookers, but you all need me real bad. So I'm yep, back. Exactly. Sonny and Pierce catch eyes to shake heads at each other. Freeze frame episode over. This was actually, I don't know, we've poked a lot of holes in the storyline here, but it's actually pretty good 
political story. I mean, they had a lot of it written for them because it's like a rip from yeah. the headlines thing, but it's pretty good. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of intrigue here. Still a question: Why is Vice involved in this investigation? As usual, <laughs> I guess it's, you know this one has more justification than any of them because it started off with the whore train. Yeah, that's true. And so they yes. were, but they didn't listen to Dad. They just kept going about their own business and investigating this when there was really nothing to investigate. And then when something big did happen, like the murder of Angelica, they didn't do the investigation. No, I mean, they don't do everything. I mean, come on. They got to have some breaks, too. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're getting into final thoughts territory. I see, I, might, like, I still really like this episode. I thought it was really good. Um, it's a nice recovery from last week. Too. Well, yeah. I mean, bull <laughs> semen to whore trains. <laughs> Combine those two. <laughs> whore trains full of bull semen. Cattle cars. There we whore go. Trains. There we go. <laughs> Next week on Dallas. <laughs> oh, God. And cowboy stubs. <laughs> but, John, we got some music to talk about this week. And I think it's going to be a little different than what the theme was last week. Let's go break down this week's music. All right, Sean, I have to admit, this theme doesn't seem to stand out as much as it did last week. What do you <laughs> got for us in music this time? <laughs> we have numero uno, one single song, and that is Stand and Deliver by Mr. Mister. Uh, it's not even my favorite <laughs> Mr. Mister song. Yeah, I know, right? So Mr. Mister was a pop rock band consisting of Richard Page, Steve George, Pat Mustelotto, and Steve Ferris. We have to go back to the origin, and that would take us back to Richard Page, who was previously a session musician for Quincy Jones mm. and had composed music for Michael Jackson, Rick Springfield, Donna Summer, and even Kenny Loggins. <laughs> I'm all right. Don't nobody worry about me. <laughs> and that actually is the theme with Mr. Mister is that pretty much they were all session musicians. Richard Page was uh, actually childhood friends with Steve George, session musicians together. They actually did some backing vocals for some pretty big musicians as well. They sang backup vocals for Al Jarreau, Cher, Amy Grant. Barry Manilow, Toto. In 1978, the two, Page and George, would form the band Pages. They would release three albums with positive reviews, but with very little success. They only had one minor hit, a song called I Believe in You. After not finding success, they actually disbanded in 81, and George and Page focused on songwriting and studio work, working with uh, pop star Laura Branigan and working with the village people, of all people. Yeah. So, uh, and that includes singing backups for the village people. By 1982, they decided to try the band life again and actually brought in fellow session artists, Pat Mastelotto and Steve Ferris on guitar. And that would form Mr. Mister. So where things get a little kind of interesting is that when they were getting ready to release their first album in 1984, Page was offered the chance to replace Bobby Kimball as the lead singer of Toto. Uh, but alas, he didn't miss the rains down in Africa. And actually, later he even had a chance to replace Peter Cetera in Chicago. He ended up turning them both down, mm -hmm. and by their second album, they would break out. Welcome to the Real World would actually have three top ten singles on it, two uh, hitting number one with the songs Kyrie and Broken Wings. It would result in them getting two Grammy nominations and touring with some pretty big names, like Tina Turner, Hart, and Don Henley, you know, boyfriend <laughs> of Donna again. Rice. <laughs> Just won't leave. <laughs> so the third album, Go On, would not be anywhere near as successful and would be the beginning of the end of Mr. Mister. Around this time, they would actually write the title song for the movie Stand and Deliver. They would also make Is It Love for the movie Stakeout. But in 1988, guitarist Steve Ferris would leave the band. First to leave, first to regret it. <laughs> uh, the, remain <laughs> the remaining members immediately act as the backing band for Christian artist Paul Clark's album, before hitting the studio themselves to record their fourth album, Go. 
But Pole would not be released. It would uh, after they completed it in '90. The record label decided to wait to release it, and the band would break up. And so they never released it. It would remain unreleased, except for one of the songs that found its way on a Greatest Hits album for 20 years before finally being released in, in 2010 on a remastered version. After the band, Page would do some, he'd release some solo albums. The common theme is that after the band broke up, they pretty much all went and did session work and compo- composed. The difference is being is Page would release like three of his own albums. And then he would be approached by Gringo Star to join Gringo's band, the 11th All-Star Band, in 2010. And he has toured with them multiple times, the last being 2017. Damn. Steve George, after leaving the band, he would become the musical director for Kenny Loggins throughout the 90s. He would enter the danger zone. (laughs) (laughs) And he's most recently toured with Jewel as her touring keyboardist. Ouch. Mm. Ouch. Mestalato. He would go on to do, of course, more session work for people like Hall and & Oates and Eddie Money. Uh, he would also co-produce Peter Kingsbury's first solo album before joining the band King Crimson. He's been a member since 94 and appeared on over 20 of their albums. King Crimson's kind of got like a cult following, but probably aren't aren't the biggest known. I, I know I've talked 20, about him in the music. 20 albums since 1994. Yes. Okay. It yeah, has that's been- insane. Yeah, it's been 24 years since 1994. How many freaking albums is that band putting out? See, Pat Masolato, he is that guy. He is that. He Not only did he do 20 albums with this band, but he was also in a crap load of other bands you have never heard of. <laughs> he just he just never stopped working. He just works for anybody. And then last but not least, Steve Ferris. So I left Steve for last because sadly he does not have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> I had to go I had to go searching for his biography. And before I get into what he did after the band, I want to talk a little bit about what I found in a biography that was suspiciously Let's put it this way. I read a biography online that very well could have been been written by Steve Ferris himself. (laughs) (laughs) All I know is that the biography claims after a show, he was invited by a member, an unnamed member of KISS, to audition to replace Ace Freely after Ace had left the band. And he was actually invited to join. They actually picked him to replace Ace Freely, but for some reason or another, it just never worked out. (laughs) Sounds suspicious. So, (laughs) very suspicious. It got very vague at the end of that, but apparently so. And then he would play with Eddie Money for three years before joining uh, Mr. Mister. Now, since Mr. Mister, he would work as a session musician. Also, if you Google his name, Steve Ferris, you will see he's got a bunch of YouTube videos, mostly him talking about different guitars. This is his blue one. This is his red one. So he likes to he likes to play his blue one when he has the blues. Um, he is also composed for advertisements uh, for companies like Budweiser, Chrysler, Southern Bell, and Audi. But that's not all he is. It's not all about music with him. He is also a hunting enthusiast. He has started several hunting groups and has appeared on hunting shows on the Outdoor Channel, The Dangerous Game and Ruger's Outdoor Adventure, as well as co-hosting Beretta Waterfowl Fowler's Edge with Sean Mann. <laughs> I wonder if at every commercial break with on the hunting shows that he's on, they play Broken Wings. <laughs> 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 or it's just one of his YouTube videos of him talking about guitars. This one's purple with polka dots. <laughs> yeah, this one's I red. I use it sometimes. <laughs> There you have everything you ever wanted and even what you probably didn't want to know about (laughs) Mr. Mister. The best people are the ones that don't have a Wikipedia page. Because they write their own. (laughs) (laughs) The the website was like user dot net dot like like it was like someone's like someone started a Reddit post and then quit and somehow it found its way onto the Internet. (laughs) It was somewhat act, though. <laughs> well, except, except for maybe that whole kiss part. <laughs> that seems highly unlikely, but you know. Well, you would think if he was offered a job joining Kiss, that he would that would have justified him to receive his own Wikipedia page. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. You know, uh, we might be overrating it. So let's go talk this one through. All right, Melissa, why don't you kick us off on your final thoughts for this episode? I didn't know that it it is interesting that that it was ripped from the headlines and now it makes a lot of sense. I did know who Gary Hart was. I did not know. I didn't know the connection or see the connection when we first, when I first watched these episodes. So I think it's a good episode compared to the bull semen episode. (laughs) Once again, we go off a little bit on the direction that we aren't supposed to be on because we're not. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, even if he did was taking campaign like bribes and stuff like that, that's not something that Secret mm, Service, FBI. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say like Miami Vice shouldn't be investigating that. Shouldn't like the gov- like the state investigate that? The FBI. Yeah. So mm-hmm. and once again it went off. James I, Comey <laughs> come parachuting in. The FBI. <laughs> yeah. The FBI is vi- the, the FBI is busy looking for people cutting off penises. <laughs> yeah, they are busy. They have had a busy couple weeks. Um no, I mean I like it. It I definitely I love the fact that it's bad balanced and has everybody in it i'm happy to see everybody back i'm happy it's not the sunny show it's everybody had a little part and you know like we got to see switech do some actual police work we got to see tubs and and sunny be together like partners not like i'm gonna do this and you're gonna be over here and separated so it went back to being what vice is supposed to be so hopefully it's a, it's an upward we're going up from here sorry I know, right? I know, I know. Baseball is a death. death. (laughs) (laughs) I know. (laughs) John, what are your final thoughts? Well, I agree with Melissa. I was very happy to see the entire crew get get involved in this episode. It was nice, like you said, getting away from the Sonny Crockett show. I joked about it a lot with the soap opera actors, but I I got I did get a little kick out of the kind of soap opera ness and just knowing the connection with Rip from the Headlines with the Senator Gary Hart and the fact that there was a vice connection in that story, almost like they were by bring by going after the guest stars of the soap opera, they were like almost like they were teasing the scandal a little bit. I did enjoy that. I thought it was I thought it was a good episode. I, I wish there was a little bit more for me to talk about with the music. I enjoyed this episode. I would have liked to see an arrest maybe at the end. Just one. Just one for all time's sake, <laughs> yeah, know. you know? <laughs> one of the things I did like about it is that we were able to, we were making jokes. We were able to make jokes about what's going on currently in politics because it still resonates with what this episode was talking about. I made a Stormy Daniels joke because it still fits. What this episode was about still fits with politics today. So I think they did a pretty good job with that considering, you know, it's really, that part of it's really held up. Looking forward to getting more toward Vice, where everyone's involved, better episodes, even though I know that we have more uh, soap opera like episodes coming. Yeah, I don't really have much to add to what you guys have already said. It's great to see the whole team, great to see Tubbs being involved. This was intriguing, it was a different story than what Vice has been telling so far in this season. It felt much more like a season two-ish episode that got sandwiched in between a couple of really bad ones in Baseballs of Death and uh, our Bull Semen semen (laughs) episode last week. (laughs) So I was really excited to see that this episode was here and and really enjoyed it, but I don't know how much I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because of what it's in between. (laughs) And if you were to put it into season two, would it still stand as being a good episode? I think that if we put it there, it was stand as a so-so episode. But here in season four, it's a great episode. And thank God we had this one. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. It was good. They did their investigations. Everything went according to plan. There's another bad guy that got away. We haven't had one of those in a long time where it didn't. It, there wasn't like a giant shootout or anything like that. Um, this was good. I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun with it, too. And Although, been- like most of the bad guys that get away, we'll probably never, ever revisit this again. <laughs> Unless you're a dirty record label executive. We'll come back to you <laughs> with a vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> this guy will still be governor. <laughs> or Willie. We'll never know, actually. <laughs> yeah. It's just the primaries. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoy this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com, twitter.com slash go with the heat, facebook.com slash go with the heat, Instagram, go with the heat. You know where to find us. We would love to hear from you. Please send us a message. What do you think about this episode? Do you think we're off base on this one? 
how do you think this would fare in season two or three as an episode? And does it benefit from being in between bowl semen and baseballs? <laughs> Email us, go at the heat at gmail.com. Let us know. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. Check out all the ways you can subscribe to the show, all the ways that you can support us. Support number one, go on your podcast platform of choice and give us a rating. Support number two, send us a message. Let us know. We got some very nice notes this last week on Twitter. We would love to see your support. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com, click on support, and you'll find all the ways you can support us, including that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.